New book? Yes, about the Civil War. Mm -hmm. I got a question for you. That sounds serious. It's a simple question, and I want a simple answer. All right. Do you think there will be a second Civil War? Hmm. We haven't finished the first one yet. <sighs> God damn it. I suppose now you're going to tell me that the Civil War never ended. That's what I'm getting out of this book, Civil War by Other Means, by Jeremy Surrey. All right, let me ask it a little different. Do you think the Civil War will flare up again? Why do you think it might? Well, I think political violence is up. There's a lot of gun-toting fash holes out there. But all those extra guns haven't yet translated to extra political violence. We haven't even reached the 1960s level of political violence, let alone the 1860s. But there are some pretty hard lines between the states. Red and blue hate each other. Those election maps obscure just how purple the states really are. In 2020, California had more Trump voters than Texas, and Texas had more Biden voters than New York. No way. Yes way. If you want to talk Civil War, let's look at how things were before the Civil War. At its founding, the United States established itself as a republic with no formal aristocracy. By 1828, over one million people could vote, regardless of property, employment, or social class. However, the franchise was limited to white men. Most women had no more rights than children, and most non-whites were non-citizens. Though grossly undemocratic by today's standards, this was quite an achievement for the early 19th century, as were the routinely peaceful transitions of power when one political party defeated another. That year, 1828, is also the year in which Vice President John C. Calhoun espoused the concept of the concurrent majority. This is an argument which claims that policy can only be set with the consent of all groups with political power. In this way, the rights of minority groups are defended against the tyranny of the majority. In practice, this doctrine has only been used to defend elite privilege and never to defend the rights of political dissenters or ethnic minorities. Calhoun wrote his treatise on the concurrent majority as a response to a very serious self-own. As a political stunt, Calhoun had helped draft a tariff bill so spectacularly awful that it could not possibly pass Congress and would embarrass his pro-tariff political opponents. To everyone's surprise, this terrible bill passed. The tariff went into effect and the agricultural economy of the South went into a tailspin. Calhoun began agitating against the tariff. He got elected to represent his home state, South Carolina, in the Senate in 1832. From this position, he advocated for nullification, a doctrine claiming that states could ignore laws they didn't like, regardless of what the courts or the Constitution had to say. Tensions between South Carolina and the federal government got so bad that both sides prepared for war. Holy shit! This guy was trying to start the Civil War 30 years early. Not at all. He participated in negotiations to end the crisis. But he's the one who started it with that political stunt. The tariff, yes. And he made it worse when he said his state could ignore it. Yes, that was him. Sounds like a total incompetent. Actually, he was quite competent. Intelligent, well-spoken, and completely wrong, even when he was right. Pro-slavery, I bet pro-slavery and anti-democracy. Calhoun felt that inherent human depravity would debase government in a democracy. He believed in a hierarchical order led by an elite that benefited from the exploitation of the lower orders. Oh, a capitalist. Wait, what do you mean wrong even when he was right? Well, he opposed American imperialism, which was good, but only because he feared an American empire would lead to race mixing. That's some spicy racism. Calhoun said that only people advanced to a high state of moral and intellectual development were capable of maintaining free government. To him, that excluded blacks and Mexicans. People in a high state of moral development don't keep slaves. Calhoun claimed slavery was not a moral evil, but a positive good. He feared that if the slaves were freed, they and their degenerate white allies would impoverish and immiserate southern whites. Didn't they do that on their own? Pretty much. While the North embraced the Industrial Revolution, the South remained agricultural. Making money as an industrial capitalist required the acquisition of raw materials, a skilled workforce, and an infrastructure capable of reliably transporting raw and finished goods. To that end, northern states invested in education and public works. Making money as a plantation owner required only land and slaves. Instead of investing profits in machinery or paying taxes for infrastructure improvements, 
Planters simply bought more land and slaves for themselves and kept firm control over their local and state governments. On a typical plantation, the amount of money invested in slaves was greater than the investment in land and implements combined. And if you weren't in the South's equivalent of the 1%, you were screwed. The big planters crowded smallholders off the best land and drove slave prices out of reach. In the North, it was not uncommon for poor white men to work their way up from unskilled labor to skilled employer. In the South, there was no such mobility. Doesn't seem too different than today. Right. Capitalism has become a lot more rapacious over the last two generations. It's harder to get ahead than it was in our parents' or grandparents' time. But having someone to look down on is important for a lot of people. I don't understand that. Don't you? I do. The dread of being picked last in PE class. The shame of being the lowest of the low. That's real. As a clumsy and plain girl, that was my life. Wasn't mine. Oh, hush. <laughs> But you're talking about children. The, these are grown-ass adults. It still applies. No one wants to be at the bottom of the heap. It's called last place aversion, the desire to avoid the lowest possible social status. It's what made American democracy possible. <sighs> In her book, How the South Won the Civil War, Heather Cox Richardson writes that legal and political equality between white men of different social standings was made possible by creating an underclass of women and non-whites. Maintaining that underclass was a priority. Those of us who have lived in multiracial neighborhoods may have a hard time understanding the absolute abject terror at the idea of having black neighbors expressed by whites in the 19th century, and today for that matter. In their 1858 debates, this fear was one of Stephen Douglas' most effective attacks against Abraham Lincoln. Douglas said, If you desire Negro citizenship, if you desire to allow them to come into Illinois and settle with the white man, if you desire them to vote on an equality with yourselves, then support Mr. Lincoln and the Black Republican Party who are in favor of the citizenship of the Negro. This worked on audiences. Lincoln had to assure voters that he would never seek citizenship for blacks, nor repeal the fugitive slave law, abolish interstate slave trading, or pursue emancipation. That same year, Senator James Hammond of South Carolina explained the Southern view of the underclass. In all social systems, there must be a class to do the menial duties, to perform the drudgery of life. That is, a class requiring but a low order of intellect and but little skill. It constitutes the very mud sill of society. Fortunately for the South, she found a race adapted to that purpose to her hand. A race inferior to her own to answer all her purposes. This idea of superiors and inferiors, a natural hierarchy of human beings, persists in conservatism to this day. Violating the natural order invites the collapse of civilization. Human beings are inherently corrupt, what with original sin, or the law of the jungle, or whatever it is that gives conservatives trust issues. I swear they're saying the same things today. They are. They're even mad at the same things. You know how much they hate the woke. I thought woke just meant treating people decently. Regardless of status or gender or ethnicity, yes. They've hated wokeness forever. For example, many young people in free states who had grown up during the political instability of the 1850s joined Republican youth organizations to bolster support for the presidential candidacy of Abraham Lincoln. So? Those youth organizations were called the Wide Awakes. Oh my god. History does repeat. History doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. I've got an idea. Let's play a game. What kind of game? Who said it? I'm going to give you some quotes, and you tell me whether they were said by John C. Calhoun or a modern-day Republican. Okay. One, the important thing is the unification of the people, and all the other people don't matter. Calhoun? No. Wait. Modern day. Correct. Trump in May 2016. Two, corporations are people. Everything corporations earn ultimately goes to people. Modern day. Yes. Mitt Romney, August 2011. Three. I hold concession or compromise to be fatal. Sounds a little old-fashioned. Calhoun? Correct. Although modern-day Republicans certainly behave like they believe this. 4. There never has yet existed a wealthy and civilized society in which one portion of the community did not, in point of fact, live on the labor of the other. Sounds like Marx, but I'm going to guess it was Calhoun. It was Calhoun, and he saw it as a good thing. Marx would have said it in condemnation. Yeah. All right, one more. I no longer think that freedom and democracy are compatible. Um, Calhoun? This was said in 2009 by Peter Thiel, paymaster to freshman Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. However, it's so close to something Calhoun once said, progressive democracy is incompatible with liberty, that I'm going to give you full credit. 
That's five out of five. Yay! What do I win? Enlightenment. The realization that the contemporary Republican Party is not in any way the party of Lincoln who fought to preserve the Union, but of John C. Calhoun, whose philosophy nearly wrecked it. Can I exchange my winnings for cash? The contempt for democracy expressed by Calhoun, and Thiel, and pretty much anyone who says America is a republic, not a democracy, was widely voiced by conservatives in the lead-up to the Civil War. In Kansas territory, pro-slavery partisans put themselves in control of elections. They gerrymandered electoral districts so that the Kansas Constitutional Convention had a substantial pro-slavery majority. At the national level, slavers were permanently outnumbered in the House and unable to get their pro-slavery agenda passed into law. For a long time, they held their own in the Senate, but when they became a minority there, they relied on the pro-South Supreme Court to push their agenda, national public opinion be damned. When Lincoln won the 1860 presidential election, Southern leaders rejected the results. Senator Jefferson Davis of Mississippi said, we're gonna build our own country with blackjack and slavery. States which were fully under conservative control left the Union before Lincoln even took the oath of office. South Carolina was the first to secede, and six more followed in short order. The federal government, under both Lincoln and his predecessor, James Buchanan, did its best to avoid violence. Once South Carolina's army fired on the federal garrison at Fort Sumter, however, the American government held nothing back. Did they think the North wouldn't fight back? They thought that Yankees were a bunch of beta cucks, while the South had a monopoly on alpha males. Sounds like they were the betas. Well, I think it was Clausewitz who said that a nation will fight a war that resembles its social system. Southern culture embraced violence as a masculine virtue, so all the most capable men went into the military if they could. But men with talents in politics, economics, production, logistics, they didn't have enough of these. Yeah, but in war, all you need is fighting men, right? Not by the 19th century. War was pretty much a national effort. But with its capital invested mostly in land and slaves, the South couldn't make the effort. War is expensive. Taxes couldn't be raised because the men in the Confederate Congress didn't want to. They'd be taxing themselves. The general public lacked the inclination or ability to buy war bonds. So the Confederates printed a lot of money, and inflation got so bad people couldn't afford food or shelter. Sounds like shit for Brain's leadership. The South had produced Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Jackson. They had high hopes, but the Confederacy died from elite failure as much as its battlefield losses. Confederate congressmen spent much of their time on grand oratory and personal feuds. Years of experience in the Federal Congress taught them how to block legislation, but not how to pass it. Sounds like today's Republicans. It does, doesn't it? I thought the South almost won a couple times. The South was more interested in big, flashy victories than in the strategy and logistics of a long-term war. They thought a few solid wins against the American army might demoralize the North and secure foreign recognition for the Confederacy, and possibly aid. Foreign aid enabled the colonists to defeat the British, after all, so why wouldn't it help defeat the Yankees? So they never had a chance? Not much of one. France had come close to recognizing the Confederacy in 1863, but after the Southern defeats at Gettysburg and Vicksburg, that hope faded. Once they were on the defensive, their best hope lay in American war exhaustion. Lincoln actually thought he might lose to a peace candidate in 1864. His re-election was saved when the army captured Atlanta. And the South surrendered after his re-election, right? A month after his second inauguration, yes. But then someone who loved the Confederacy more than America murdered him. Lincoln's assassination made Andrew Johnson president. This meant that, at the end of the war, the White House was occupied not by an anti-slavery Republican, but by a Democrat who had once owned slaves. Johnson offered generous readmission terms to the traitorous states. Former Confederate states would return to the Union with more political power than before. Their black citizens counted as full people, no more of that three-fifths nonsense. Before leaving office, Johnson would pardon former Confederates, including rebel leaders. When the Confederacy surrendered, tens of thousands of rebel fighters mutinied rather than obey their surrender orders. The mutineers fled to Mexico, Brazil, and elsewhere. In Mexico, Confederate exiles signed on with the French-backed Mexican Empire in its effort to crush Mexican democracy. The exiles hoped that France would help them rebuild the Confederacy, first in Mexico and then in the United States. Jeremy Surrey writes, They were trying to recapture the lands they had abandoned by enlisting foreign invaders. They dreamed of a renewed Confederate Empire, partnered with the French Empire, and believed their treason was perversely patriotic. Their colony was maintained with imperial stipends and the protection of French troops. When these were withdrawn in 1867, the colony collapsed. Guess they couldn't make it without someone else doing all their work for them. What happened to them? The rebels in Mexico? 
Most returned to the United States and resumed their former lives. No goddamn way. Many of them even took up leadership positions once again. Leadership of what? They betrayed the United States. They mutinied against the Confederacy. Who would trust two-time traitors? Alexander Terrell was a three-time traitor. After betraying the United States and mutinying against the Confederacy, he volunteered to spy on the United States on behalf of the Emperor of Mexico. He took the Emperor's money, but may not have actually done any spying. Please tell me he ended up in front of a firing squad. Nope. Remember how Trump had no problem with getting help from Russia? Terrell and the other Confederate exiles in Mexico had no problem with living in and working for a violent dictatorship until they could come home and reclaim power. I hope at least he had a short, miserable life. He was elected to the Texas legislature, where he wrote the election laws that took away black Texans' voting rights and lived to be 84 years old. I think I'm gonna break something. One of the reasons that villains such as Alexander Terrell were allowed to write the laws that disenfranchised blacks was that voting rights for blacks was not popular with white Americans. In autumn 1865, three loyal states asked voters to approve black suffrage, and in each case, voters rejected the proposals. Efforts to give freed slaves decent lives were also unpopular. Proposals to break up the plantations and give land to the people who had worked it all their lives failed. An effort to establish civil rights for blacks was killed by presidential veto. Johnson denounced it as a support system for the indigent that discriminated against whites. Congress had to pass the 14th Amendment to get around the presidential veto. When black votes produced multiracial state governments, conservative whites responded with violence. Nonviolent appeals to white supremacy worked as well, as large numbers of white voters did not want to be represented in federal or state legislatures by black men. The Panic of 1873 and the resulting economic depression diverted national attention away from Reconstruction. Democrats regained control of the House of Representatives in 1875, signaling the end of efforts to establish civil rights for black Americans. The 1876 presidential election saw political violence and fraud across the South. To this day, nobody knows who actually won the most votes, but a political compromise gave the presidency to Republican Rutherford B. Hayes on the condition that federal troops be removed from the South. A few years later, the Supreme Court gave its stamp of approval to racial segregation in Plessy v. Ferguson, except for a decade or two at the end of the 20th century, in which conservatives abandoned the Democratic Party for the Republican Party. Single-party state governments dedicated to preserving white supremacy have dominated the South ever since. So you see, the South reversed everything for which the Civil War had been fought. They re-implemented slavery in the form of Jim Crow. But the Republicans were anti-slavery. I don't get why they let it come back. They had only wanted to stop the harm that slavery did to free labor. They wanted the South's economy reintegrated into the national economy as quickly as possible. It was about money. It's always about money. Breaking up the plantations and giving land to the ex-slaves who had built them would not have delivered short-term economic benefits. Ongoing violence and terror isn't good for an economy either. Dr. Suri writes, It was easier to leave the defeated white elites in place and to renew business partnerships with them. That explains the title of this book. And this one. What the South couldn't win on the battlefield, they won through terror. Corrupt elites were temporarily shut out of politics, some living in exile in the embrace of a foreign power. But within a few years, they were back and more corrupt than ever. They were able to enrich themselves and impoverish the people of their states, just like in the good old days. Jim Crow laws were a legal authoritarian oppression of black Americans. Black middle-class families which had struggled up from slavery following the end of the Civil War were deliberately impoverished. White mobs leveled well-off black neighborhoods in Atlanta, Chicago, and Tulsa. When black families migrated to places without legal segregation, de facto segregation restricted them to the worst jobs and poorest housing. Where sincere efforts at multiracial democracy were made, white supremacists destroyed them. Benjamin Tillman was a violent white supremacist who led a band of red shirts. Uh, no, not those red shirts. These were paramilitary militias aligned with the Democratic Party. Tillman's willingness to support violence to maintain white supremacy kick-started a political career that made him governor of South Carolina and later U.S. Senator. Hmm. South Carolina again. What is going on there? Is it something in the water? Anyway, Tillman openly boasted of the fraud and violence he had used to dismantle voting rights for blacks and establish conservative rule. He encouraged whites to murder blacks and overthrow multiracial governments whenever possible. In 1898, North Carolina red shirts took part in a successful coup against the city government of Wilmington, which led to the installation of a white supremacist government. Benjamin Tillman was one of South Carolina's two senators from 1895 to 1918. From 1956 to 2003, his seat was occupied by Strom Thurmond, who was one of the first federal office holders 
to move from the Democratic to the Republican Party once the Republicans began courting white voters in the South. Thurmond was succeeded by Trump loyalist Lindsey Graham. Today, the Republican Party, the party not of Abraham Lincoln but of John C. Calhoun, draws its electoral strength not from one particular region but from rural areas and small towns across America. The clean geographic split that existed at the time of the Civil War is gone. So does that mean we won't be seeing Civil War II electric boogaloo? I doubt it. In 1860, the nation was so divided that Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot in 10 of the 11 states that became the Confederacy. Today, there are heavily Republican areas in California and New York, and heavily Democratic areas in Texas and Florida. There's still a lot of angry and violent talk out there. Yes, there is. In October 2021, one of the attendees at Turning Point USA, an organization of young Republicans, asked the question, when do we get to start using the guns? Oh, Christ. It's like they can't wait. It's another echo of Reconstruction. Paramilitaries in the 1860s and 1870s were officially rifle clubs, but they helped overthrow a few governments, like in Wilmington. The National Rifle Association was originally a gun safety and sport organization, but in the 1960s and 1970s, conservatives began to assert that the Second Amendment conferred a right to overthrow the government. I call bullshit on that. You are right to do so. The Constitution itself establishes penalties for insurrection. Even so, it became the official ideology of the NRA and other gun organizations, and insurrectionary ideas are plentiful on the right. Conservatives attempted to overthrow the government in 2021. And you're still trying to convince me that Civil War II isn't going to happen? There's no organization to what's happening. The Civil War had armies with military leadership, supply chain logistics, and a geographic base of operation. In Reconstruction, however, there was no single leader of the paramilitary terror groups, the Klan, the Red Shirts, and others. Because they were beaten on the battlefield. Right. And they always claimed to be doing what they did in order to defend themselves and their communities. When Benjamin Tillman spoke of his participation in a massacre in Hamburg, South Carolina, he spoke of the fanatical teachings and fiendish hate of those who sought to substitute the rule of the African for that of the Caucasian. Sounds like he was a fanatic. He was. He was absolutely fanatical about maintaining white supremacy. Like the men who had betrayed the United States and then mutinied against the Confederacy, he was loyal only to himself and used white supremacy as a tool with which to obtain power. Like Republicans today. Like Republicans today. Just as slavers often spoke of Lincoln's hatred for white civilization, contemporary conservatives speak of Democrats' anti-white racism. Conservatives in the 1870s claimed fraud when they lost elections, when what really upset them was black people voting. Even today, voter fraud just means black people are voting. From the Republican point of view, the Democratic Party is not a legitimate governing partner because there are elements within it that seek to end the injustices on which Republicans depend for their wealth, power, and status. Of course, the Democratic Party also has a small conservative faction and a large centrist faction which aren't particularly interested in shaking things up because they also benefit from social and economic injustice and the unearned privilege that comes with it. But to Republicans, the entire Democratic Party is a socialist revolutionary movement no matter how many capitalist entrepreneurs the party attracts, and no matter how much actual socialists complain about the party's shortcomings. Given this view of the Democrats, a political system that makes it possible for Democrats to defeat Republicans is inherently illegitimate. It doesn't matter that Democratic policies are popular and Republican policies are not, only that if the people are going to choose to put Democrats in charge, then the people should not be allowed a choice. Conservative thought leaders are already making the case for a single-party authoritarian state. The conservative Claremont Institute opined that most Americans do not count as Americans and that the GOP needs voting restrictions to win. In October 2022, The Federalist, a conservative magazine, presented arguments in favor of using government power to break up corporations deemed too inclusive in their marketing, woke corporations, and they go on to make other suggestions you'll love. I gotta tell you, The Federalist really puts the MAGA in magazine. Get a load of this. An end to no-fault divorce, because too many women are getting out of bad marriages. An absolute ban on abortion, because too many women have access to health care. The elimination of transgender people, because too many women have bigger penises than conservative men. When I consider it, I don't think conservatives know how weird they are. They think they set the standard of what is normal, but normal people aren't viscerally disgusted by anyone not exactly like them. If you want a picture of the ideal conservative world, imagine white people eating white bread forever. Oh, that's a strange way to put it. I'm hungry. But remember when that Latinos for Trump guy said that a democratic victory would mean a taco truck on every corner? That sounds awesome. 
Why would anyone want to live in the boring world conservatives want? Most people don't. That's why Republicans want to use state power to reshape the world and the people in it. I'd like to use state power to lock them up. That's perfectly reasonable. When you're dealing with extremists who pose an ongoing public safety threat, someone has to call them out as an existential danger to America. I'll do it. Let's lock up Trump. It is not just Trump. Every Republican who enabled Trump's depravity is a danger to America and the world. What they want to do to this country would destroy it, and they're using the same rhetoric as the slavers who tried to destroy it in the Civil War. They want to put America under a single-party authoritarian system. You said they set up single-party systems in their states. Yes. Conservatives are saying that government by mere numbers undermines civilization. Jonathan Worth of North Carolina, a pro-union slaver who was governor of the state right after the Civil War, said the same thing. Right after the Civil War? These guys never let up. No, they don't. That's why I keep coming back to my original question. Which was... Will there be a second Civil War? I doubt it. The conditions aren't right. No one's really organizing for a war. Most Republicans are upper-income types who have too much to lose. Almost no one really wants a war either. In the 2022 midterms, nearly all of the candidates who claimed Democrats can only win through massive electoral fraud accepted their defeat like normal candidates in a normal democracy. Oof. But the conditions are right for a second reconstruction, with all the terror and violence that implies. Don't be surprised if, in five years' time, there's a Ruby Ridge-style confrontation, or an Oklahoma City bombing, or a Waco siege every month. Well, shit. America is a synthesis of two ways of organizing society. Egalitarian ideals born from the Enlightenment and humanist values, and hierarchical ideas based on tradition and privilege. Equality for white men was made possible by denying equality to women and non-whites. Placing women and black people in a permanent underclass meant that mediocre white men did not have to compete with them. Slavery helped create the idea of whiteness. The violence necessary to perpetuate slavery helped create a violent, masculine culture in the South. To quote Jeremy Suri, they were white because they ruled dark-skinned people, and they were men because they used violence for personal gain. Over the last half century, the civil rights situation for everyone once denied rights has improved. At the same time, deregulated capitalism has impoverished and immiserated whole communities. Mediocre white men now have to compete with women and non-whites for a diminished slice of the economy. It's harder for everyone, regardless of ability, to get even the basics of a good life. Mediocre white men deserve good lives too, and they have every right to be angry. The Republican Party has successfully convinced millions of them that their diminished opportunities are the fault not of the corporations which sent their jobs overseas, or the billionaires who suck wealth out of the economy to enlarge their hordes, but of women and black people and the LGBT community. Conservative leaders today are using very similar rhetoric to what we heard from conservative leaders before, during, and after the Civil War. They are, like John C. Calhoun, determined to preserve the privileges of a wealthy, powerful minority against the threat posed by democratic government. They are, like Benjamin Tillman, encouraging fraud and violence to dismantle voting rights and establish conservative rule. They are, like Alexander Terrell, willing to work with foreign dictatorships in order to win power in America. Though there is one bit of rhetoric which seems new. Conservatives like to claim that critical race theory is being used in elementary schools to make white children feel guilty about being white. They don't like the fact that people who aren't white are adding to our perspectives, our culture, and our historical awareness. The right wants to talk about white guilt. They want to make it sound like any talk about white supremacy past and present and systemic racism, past and present, is blaming, is punishing, whites today for the actions of their ancestors. That's not what's going on. What is going on is a recognition of the injustices, deliberate or otherwise, that our ancestors inflicted and perpetuated. We have the opportunity to build a better world, a world with less injustice, in which anyone of any background can participate. But because that world means slightly less power for the powerful, slightly less wealth for the wealthy, and slightly less privilege for the privileged, conservatives are fighting against it. Some are asking, when do we get to start using the guns? You know I can't say no when you use those three little words. I'll let you know I'm ready. Yes. Until then, bye-bye. Oh? Eavesdropping? Not intentionally. A loved one? My brother. Oh, for a moment I thought you had a date. No, 
I don't think I'll be dating again until I've healed. Why did you think I had a date? I overheard something about three little words. Oh. Doug invited me to dinner at his place. I really don't like leaving the hotel, so he used the three little words we use when something is important to us. I love you? No, it's from a video game. The only phrases I know from video games are like two words, like headshot or finish him or monster kill. But you don't play violent video games. I did, and occasionally still do. In this game, one wandered through an underwater city inspired by Atlas Shrugged, shooting objectivists in the face. Brutal. Almost as brutal as reading Atlas Shrugged, yes. Mm. So what's the three words? Would you kindly. If he starts a request with that, I know it's important to him, and vice versa. The family that video games together stays together. Yes, indeed. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm off to the kitchenette to make myself lunch. Would you make me a sandwich? Come with me. You can make it yourself. Would you kindly make me a sandwich? <sighs> All right. It was the design of Marcus Rich and Joseph Dewey and Thomas Smith to call on the terrible old man. This old man dwells all alone in a very ancient house on Water Street near the sea and is reputed to be both exceedingly rich and exceedingly feeble, which forms a situation very attractive to men of the profession of Messrs. Rich, Dewey, and Smith, for that profession was nothing less dignified than robbery. The inhabitants of Kingsport say and think many things about the terrible old man. He is, in truth, a very strange person, believed to have been a ship captain in his day, so old that no one can remember when he was young, and so taciturn that few know his real name. Among the gnarled trees in the front yard of his aged and neglected place, he maintains a strange collection of large stones, oddly grouped and painted so that they resemble the idols in some obscure eastern temple. This collection frightens away most of the small boys who love to taunt the terrible old man about his long white hair and beard, or to break the small paned windows of his dwelling with wicked missiles. But there are other things which frighten the older and more curious folk who sometimes steal up to the house to peer in through the dusty panes. These folk say that on a table in a bare room on the ground floor are many peculiar bottles, in each a small piece of lead suspended pendulum-wise from a string. And they say that the terrible old man talks to these bottles, addressing them by such names as Jack, Scarface, Long Tim, Spanish Joe, Peters, and Mate Ellis and that whenever he speaks to a bottle, the little lead pendulum within makes certain definite vibrations as if in answer. Those who have watched the tall, lean, terrible old man in these peculiar conversations do not watch him again. But Marcus Rich and Joseph Dewey and Thomas Smith saw in the terrible old man merely a tottering, almost helpless greybeard who could not walk without the aid of his knotted cane and whose thin, weak hands shook pitifully. To a robber whose soul is in his profession, there is a lure and a challenge about a very old and very feeble man who has no account at the bank and who pays for his few necessities at the village store with Spanish gold and silver minted centuries ago. Messrs. Rich, Dewey, and Smith selected the night of April 11th for their call. Mr. Rich and Mr. Smith were to interview the poor old gentleman whilst Mr. Dewey waited for them and their presumable metallic burden with a covered motor car in Ship Street. Messrs. Rich and Smith met in Water Street by the old man's front gate, and although they did not like the way the moon shone down upon the painted stones through the budding branches of the gnarled trees, they had more important things to think about. They donned masks and knocked politely at the weather-stained oaken door. Waiting seemed very long to Mr. Dewey as he fidgeted restlessly in the covered motor car by the terrible old man's back gate in Ship Street. He was more than ordinarily tender-hearted, and he did not like the hideous screams he had heard in the ancient house just after the hour appointed for the deed. Had he not told his colleagues to be as gentle as possible with the pathetic old sea captain? Then he sensed a soft tread or tapping on the walk inside the gate heard a gentle fumbling at the rusty latch, 
and saw the narrow, heavy door swing inward. And in the pallid glow of the single dim street lamp, he strained his eyes to see what his colleagues had brought out of that sinister house. But when he looked, he did not see what he expected, for his colleagues were not there at all, but only the terrible old man leaning quietly on his knotted cane and smiling hideously. Mr. Dewey had never before noticed the color of that man's eyes. Now he saw that they were yellow. Little things make considerable excitement in little towns, which is the reason that Kingsport people talked all that spring and summer about the three unidentifiable bodies, horribly slashed as with many cutlasses, and horribly mangled as by the tread of many cruel boot heels, which the tide washed in. And some people even spoke of things as trivial as the deserted motor car found in Chip Street, or certain especially inhuman cries, probably of a stray animal, heard in the night by wakeful citizens. But in this idle village gossip, the terrible old man took no interest at all. <laughs>